Is the technology gap choking the life out of your business? Find out how to save it on today's episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Novo, the no-fee business bank that refunds fees charged by other ATMs, even internationally. Get $25 when you sign up today at servemaster.com front slash Novo. That's N-O-V-O. Are you tired of dealing with your boss? Do you feel underpaid and underappreciated? If you want to make it online, fire your boss and start living your retirement dreams now. Then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Serve No Master Podcast, where you'll learn how to open new revenue streams and make money while you sleep. Presented live from a tropical island in the South Pacific by best-selling author, Jonathan Green. Now, here's your host. It's early morning in my garden, and yet somehow it's really, really hot because it just, we just had a light rain, so it's quite steamy. And there goes the neighbor's rooster, relentless, unstoppable, implacable. He's always there waiting for me. Today, we're going to talk about a gap in your business. Now, for every single person, this will be different. There are going to be areas where you're strong and you're weak. Today is about what to do when there's an area of your business where you're weak and how to fill in that gap. Before we get started, let me tell you about my strengths and weaknesses. I'm an old school email marketer. I'm very good and very comfortable at building an email list and sending messages. That's my area of strength. Where I'm not good, where my weakness is, is social media. Now, for everyone, this could be something different. Some of you, most of you are probably much better at social media than me. And if you follow me on social media channels, you'll notice that for years, it's been very awkward. It's getting better now, but it is very hard for me. I have 11 members on my team and we're still not where I want to be with social media because it's just outside my skill set, but we're building and growing there. So the first place to start is to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. There are some things where I'm really, really good. And there are certain apps where I am just absolutely terrible. I've never sent a Snapchat. I don't know how Instagram works or why people like it because those came after I got old. I grew up on Friendster, which then grew into MySpace, and I was really, really good at MySpace. Boy, is that an irrelevant skill. My college band was all over MySpace, building a following, posting our songs, announcing our gigs, all those things. Guess what? Nobody cares anymore. That skill set is totally useful because the site died. It was outside my control. That's why I don't get excited about learning new platforms. One of the things that many people are surprised to find out considering making a living online is that I don't like the internet. I like it as a useful tool. I I read a few blogs, but what I don't do is hang out on Facebook all day and read other people's posts. I just don't have time for that. If I'm online, I'm working. If I'm at the computer, I'm working. I have zero games on my computer. doesn't mean that I don't play games. I have a PlayStation. I was just playing some games with my kids this morning. Today, they asked to play a game that was way too hard for them, so they were frustrated. I said, guys, I told you, let's play a kid's game that you can manage, but you know, they always want to try something harder. They got, they got blocked by the same technology gap we're talking about today. So I know what I'm good and not good at. There are certain people who they just love Twitter. They love being in those conversations. I've never figured out Twitter. I tried for a while ago. Actually, I tried 10 years ago. I knew the first guy who ever got a million followers on Twitter. I knew people that ran their entire businesses. They, did, they didn't do phone numbers or texting. They just did direct messages on Twitter. I can never figure it out. No matter which software I use or which dashboard or trying to keep track of these conversations, I also don't really understand why you want to have conversations in public. I just don't. It doesn't mean that tons of people aren't into it. It just happens to not be me. So I'm not good at it. The greatest example of this is hashtags and viral memes and viral videos. I'm the last person to ever see those things because I'm not plugged into the right social networks or the popular one. I don't know. I was the last person to see Honey Badger like three years late after like it was no longer popular anymore. Someone said, did you ever see that video? I go, what video? And I wish I could give you a more up-to-date reference, but that's the last viral video that I think I've seen. Sometimes I hear people talk about other viral videos, but I've never, you know, I don't watch them. I watch very, very little YouTube, even though I put a lot of content on there and my kids love it. My kids love watching videos on YouTube. So they're of a different generation. The way they engage is totally different. My kids do not understand things that aren't touch screens. This morning, When my son was choosing which video game he wanted to play, I have to use the controller and slide left or right. And he's holding up his hand like he's Tom Cruise in Minority Report and just waving it to make the screen roll over. I was like, not everything works that way. He's used to touchscreens. His whole life has been touchscreens. Touchscreens didn't exist until I was out of my formative years. I grew up on a keyboard. So I have these limitations, and that's absolutely fine. For younger people, social media, touchscreens sending videos and messages to their phone, being very fast at doing those things. I don't know how to do, I don't, not that I don't know how, I don't do emojis. I probably send 10 emojis a year, of which maybe eight will be on accident. I still send emoticons, right? I send the text-based ones because I'm a dinosaur. 
there's two things I want you to realize. Number one is that you can still build a really good online business even though you're a dinosaur, which is what I've done. And number two, there's a way to overcome whatever your technological hurdle is, whatever the thing is that you're not good at. And it can be a lot of things. There are so many things now inside my business that this applies to, okay? Anything my page builder does, anything my developer does, the conversations I have with the leader of my SEO team, boy, I get the gist of it. Paris, who's amazing and runs most of the company, doesn't even understand that much. That's how advanced she is. And so that gets me to the idea is understanding that things that are hard for us actually for younger people become a ubiquitous skill. Finding people who are good at Facebook is not very hard. Walk into a high school and throw a rock. It will hit one person, bounce off another, and they'll both be good at social media. Things that were rare skills of my generation, and I realize many of you listening are older than me. That's how fast technology moves. There's a moment in Back to the Future, uh, maybe, no, Back to the Future Part 2. Michael J. Fox is in a 7-Eleven or some type of convenience store, and he plays a game where you hold a light gun and he's shooting all the things in this game. I think it was a cowboy game. I just remember it was a gun game. And he's like, bang, 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 bang. Look how good I am. And these two kids are like, oh, you have to use your hands? Gross. It's so amazing how we can get really excellent at things that people don't experience. And my children have never played a pinball game. Pinball machines are fascinating to me because they're so fragile. And they're so hard. I'm so terrible at them. I can't remember the last time I've seen one. I'm trying to think. Because I do go to the arcade with my kids, but usually they get on those rides that just bounce around. It's like an airplane or a car, and they sit in it and it bounces around. They don't do much beyond that, but I don't think I've seen a pinball machine since I left America. And they were starting to fade even when I was coming up, but they still existed. So the fact that everyone of a certain generation could do something specific means that it's a commodity. It's not a valuable skill. Being good at social media is not expensive. If you can't do it, it seems like so distant. It seems like, wow, how can someone get so good at Instagram? How can someone put all those tags on their post, right? It's, it's impressive to me when people have that skill. But what you'll notice is that millions of people are pretty good at it. I can't tell you how many people I've met who graduated from college in the last 10 years with degrees in social media, which to me is terrifying because their approach to social media is not mine. I use social media to grow my business. I don't care about reach or following or coolness. I just don't. I don't need to be cool anymore. I was very cool in my late 20s for about three years and a small period of my life when I was very cool. 27 years before that, not cool. The last 10 years, I'm a dad and I tell dad jokes. It just is what it is. Life is about change and I accept that. The beauty of this understanding, and this is how I want to revolutionize your thinking, is that when you realize that just because something's valuable to you doesn't mean it's expensive. It can be a commodity, which means you can hire other people to do it. Now, another example of this in a specific case to me, which is not a technology gap, but I have an inability with the podcast. The reason I didn't do podcast episodes for three years was not because I wasn't able to record episodes, but it was because I wasn't able to post episodes. I have a limited amount of time I can spend on the computer. Sometimes I can't use my computer for several days at a time, and the podcast unfortunately dropped to the bottom of the pile. Now I have a team member who runs the entire podcast from A to Z. The only part she doesn't do is the editing of the videos and the editing of the audio. So we have an expert who does that part, then she handles everything else from choosing the topics and the keywords to telling me what the you know rough outline of what we're going to talk about is, all the way through writing the show notes, writing the blog post, writing the post that appears if you uh, look at the description inside your phone, if you're looking at an app and you click on the picture of the episode. She manages all of that. So when you have one of these gaps, you can find people to fill them in. And it comes from approaching it and seeing this is a business problem. As soon as we see this as a business problem, we can look for a business solution. Some people look at me, and maybe some of you listening right now are thinking the same thing. Wow, Jonathan isn't good at Instagram or Bebo or Bumble or whatever the latest social media platforms are. He's a dinosaur. How sad for him. It's not a problem with me. It's not a personal problem. It's not an inadequacy. One of the episodes, in fact, the episode that people ask me about the most is why do I have an episode about how important it is to teach your children to swim? It doesn't fit with anything else that I teach about here. If you listen to that episode, you'll know that I saw an amazing athlete drown in front of me in college and it's haunted me ever since. And when I was in my mid-20s, I saved a girl from drowning who now has at least two kids. Last time I checked, she has two kids. And it was the most significant I did in my entire life until I started having kids. And I live on an island where loads of people don't know how to swim and that haunts me. So sometimes I teach things that don't fit in with everything else because they're important to me. My first son, I started teaching at six weeks after birth. My next son, I taught at five weeks. I said, oh, I bet I can do this a week earlier. I would have started on day one, but my wife wouldn't let me. Because it's that important to me. My kids are really, really, really good swimmers. My oldest son, unfortunately, swims in a way that makes it look like he can't swim. 
He has a very unique swimming style, but he can swim really far for a really long time. Absolutely, people have jumped in a pool to save him, and he's turned to them and said, what are you doing? I'm not drowning. <laughs> this is what it looks like when I swim. Obviously, I never discourage someone, because if you think a kid's drowning, I encourage you to jump in and save them, absolutely. Even if you're unsure, hey, err on the side of caution, totally fine. But I'm a big believer in that, because to me, that's a personal problem. That's an important thing, right? That's life-changing. You do want that skill, because it's a survival skill not being good at social media, not being good at email, not being good at writing blog posts. These are not personal problems. They're business problems. And there are two ways to solve a business problem. Every single business problem, there's two ways you can solve it. Time or money, time or treasure. You can either learn how to do it and put in your extra hours doing it, or you can invest money in a solution to the problem. And money can mean buying software, buying training, or paying someone else to do it. I never want it to seem, I never want to put solutions in front of you that you don't have access to simply because I'm further up the mountain than you. I, sometimes I get emails from people that think I'm bragging because I have a staff. It's not, that's not the case. I've spent 10 years building towards this team. And so I want to show you the solutions I used when I was starting in the middle of my career and now. When I was starting out, the solution was always time. I had a lot of time to live in my mom's basement. I'll put as much time as possible. I was working 14 to 18 hour days. I was drinking Red Bulls like crazy. And then I had a heart incident. I no longer drink. Red Bulls, or any energy drinks, because they don't give me energy, they give me heart problems, and I don't want to ever have that happen to me again, but that was me, that was how hard I was pushing myself, because I had time, that was the resource I had the most of, now, my situation is different, I don't have a lot of time available, as much as I'd love to say that I'm living the four-hour workweek lifestyle, I work seven days a week, and I work two shifts every single day, or almost every single day, sometimes I take a half day off, and this is actually, this is like something deep and I didn't mean to slip into this direction, but this is something that comes from my father. My father I've always felt was a workaholic. He worked so many hours and he was actually like, you should work five and a half days a week. He was like, don't work on Sunday, only work a half day on Saturday. <laughs> that was my dad, dad's advice to me recently. And as I grew up, one of my great regrets was that he had spent so much time in the office. Now he gave me a great life, a great childhood, but I wish he'd been around more. And that's why I'm around by my kids more. That's why even though you hear my kids screaming in the background of these episodes, you'll never hear me shouting to tell them to go inside. If they're around me and they're playing and they're not screaming, then I love having them around me. I'm around them all the time because I'm adapting to that, right? I'm pivoting. Oh, oh, my dad provided me in so many amazing ways. I want to be there for my kids. I want to be around my kids. I want to see them a little bit more because that's one thing that in his situation, because he was working in a large company, he didn't have that option available. So I've built towards adding that one other thing. But that means I don't have as much time available. I already have maxed out how much I can work because if I'm not working, I'm spending time with my kids. And that's really important to me. That's the life balance that I seek because freedom of movement, freedom of time is very important to me. So when you're looking at solving a problem, the first question you have to ask yourself is, how long will this take me to learn? The reason I don't dive into social media, let me make this clear, I do go through social media training courses so that I can have a big picture of view and have a plan and I have an understanding of it, but the mechanics of it, the day-to-day -day of it, I don't dive into because it's constantly changing. Let's say if I did this when I first started out, I was bad at Twitter, I said, okay, I'm gonna join Twitter, I'm gonna learn it and I master Twitter, well, guess what? The next thing happens and the next thing and the next thing. And so you, the reason I don't invest in mastering social media is it's a never changing landscape. What you have to know is constantly shifting. And the best market for you is different at any given time. So I realize that the best investment for me is to invest my time in other areas that stay consistent. The principles of emailing haven't really changed since I started my business. Some of the technology has changed. I have abilities now when it comes to email customization based on your actions that I didn't used to have, but that's about it. The structure of an email, the types of emails I write, the types of messages I can send out, they haven't changed that much. Ever since I started, people have been talking about video email, and one day maybe it will exist, but so far we're not there yet. So when I'm deciding how to invest my time, the question is how long will it take me? And not just to learn it, but to stay current. One of the reasons I stopped doing my own SEO, my own search engine optimization, is that staying current requires a lot of effort. My SEO team leader, I think she's so smart. And I absolutely believe her researching and reading articles and going through training courses is part of her job because the rules in the landscape is constantly changing. So she has to stay up to date. I don't have time to do that. I learned it all. Most of my knowledge is out of date. That's why I can understand the gist of what she says, but the mechanics of it are so different now. So you can choose to do it yourself. If it's a skill that will stay consistent for a long time or that it won't take you too long to stay good at, or that there's a really good return on investment that can make sense for you to master it. And you can go to the previous episodes where I talk about how to hire and build out a team. And once you master something, then you just want to find someone who's 80% as good as you to fill in that role so you can master the next thing. I used to be a big believer, never hire someone who could do something you don't know how to do. Because <laughs> I had a lot of problems. When I built my first team, I had a lot of people that I hired to do things that were way outside my skill set. I was unable to check if they were doing a run on me. But now, 
I can at least look at the results. An example of this is when I hired my developer, the question I asked her in the hiring process, I didn't know the answer to. I didn't know how to fix this particular problem. What I looked at was could people explain in a succinct way what they would do and did it sound logical to me and did I feel comfortable with what their process would be. That's how I hired someone. So even though I don't know what he's actually doing, I know what I want it to look like at the end. A great example of this, of me actually doing the, have an employee do it, is when I was working on redesigning my pop-ups and improving my communication, my free gifts, because I want everyone to see all the different free gifts because I work so hard on them. I want as many people to get them as possible. Every time you watch a video in one of my different YouTube topic threads, you'll notice that it ends with a different free gift. So I want those all off my website too. I mean, I made them, might as well give them away, right? So I was going to do it myself and I was like, wait a minute, I don't remember how to do this anymore. When I realized that, that's when I knew I shouldn't do this anymore. I would have to relearn how to do it, do a demonstration or do a couple of them and then try to pass it on to my team or I would do them all. But it's not a good use of my time because it's now I have someone on the team who's actually good at technology. And so I recorded some a training video and wrote an explanation of what I need under project management software and then I passed it on. I'm still learning this. What I want you to see is that sometimes we still, when I sit down, I go, wait, is this the best use of my time? I'm able to get a better result because there's going to be maintenance and maintaining it. So even if I relearn how to do all this stuff, again, remember, it's hard for me to use the computer. So if I spend six hours, which probably would have taken to relearn how to do this and build out a couple of these forms and get everything set up, I'm still going to have to come back and maintain stuff. If I don't teach a team member and I'm having a bad eye day, which I have a lot of, or I can't use a computer and we need to fix something, suddenly we have a problem. So part of this is learning how to let go for me. I want you to be on this journey with me. So when you're facing a technology gap, each time look at what is the right solution for you. So for some of my technology gaps, when I was first starting out, just training, teach myself how to do it. The second is software. There's a lot of software out there designed to make things easier for you. There are software out there, for example, I use Xero, X-E-R-O, to handle all of my money, to keep track of where money comes in and money goes out. Because I, I don't just use a spreadsheet. Why? Guys, I'm not good at spreadsheets. I wish. I really, if there was one thing I wish I was good at, it was spreadsheets. I wish I was better at that because when I see people who are good at spreadsheets, I'm so impressed. I think it's a beautiful and wonderful skill because it really applies to basically every business out there. <laughs> Another one of my gaps. So what do I do? I hire people that are good at spreadsheets. But in this case, the first solution is I have a software that makes it easier for me. I own a lot of software. Over the years, I purchased lots and lots of different pieces of software and tools. I cannot build a web page from scratch, but I can use a page builder. So that's what we have is software that makes it easier to build a website. But you have to follow the, the negative is that you have to follow their systems. You have to learn their process. And then they're usually slower than pure HTML sites, but I can't build pure HTML. I can't learn that skill. Learning to develop. Boy, that takes years. It takes four to eight years. I don't have that kind of time. So there are some really cool tools out there for social media management that I use. I have a social media schedule. I have a plugin that automatically reposts my blog posts to my social media channels. I do use some tools. I have a tool that lets you schedule posts to Instagram. And if you look, I, sometimes there are Instagram posts and sometimes there aren't because, well, it's an issue with finding the right person. I had someone who I was trying to get to post stuff to Instagram. This wasn't working out. And I didn't really understand it. I understand it better now. I've been through some really good training recently, but it's hard for me to get up and post at the right time every single day. So I would have to have a person do it or software do it for scheduling because I'm on a different time zone than the rest of the world. The third way to do it, which is what I do mostly now, and this is a new thing, this is only in the last year, is have an employee do it. Um, another great example of this process is when I first wrote Serve No Master in 2016, came out in, I think, August, about a week before the book came out, before the pre-release, I got an email from one of my early readers that said, your book is garbage. And it was brutal. I can be honest with you. I cried when I read her email. It was really harsh. She goes, who edited this? A monkey? Now, when it comes to English, I am very prideful. Here's why. On the college entrance examination, the SAT, I scored a perfect on the English section. When I was in high school, I was the best sentence diagrammer. I have a master's degree in applied linguistics, which means I have a master's degree in teaching English to foreigners to teaching English as a second language to understanding the art of learning language. And yet, turns out, I stink at editing. Did not feel good. All those degrees were not in editing. So what did I do? I downloaded the free version of Grammarly and I started editing my book. I actually eventually bought the paid version, but you can do, you don't really need the paid version, I'll be honest with you. 90% of what I changed was with the free version of Grammarly. It was finding all these mistakes and I was like, whoa. And I put, I think, it was so many hours, but it was three days without, almost without sleeping. That's all I did was try to fix my book. And I got the edits done so late, I wasn't allowed to do a pre-release on Amazon for a full year. That was my punishment because I changed the book before launch, just in time. That book is what you've seen now. 
what you might find interesting is that I then sent the new edition to that person and they said, eh, still sucks. And I was like, what? <laughs> 405 star reviews, but she would have been one of my three stars. Turns out you can't please everyone, but it changed it. So use the free version of the software tool. It helps me to edit. I was investing time. Then I use the paid version, make it a little bit faster. Now I use Pro Writing Aid, which I recommend. Got a link to Pro Writing Aid below this video. I think Pro Writing Aid is better. Grammarly is great. Pro Writing Aid has really stepped up to the plate and they've done some very cool things. I'm a big fan because they have more features and they have a lifetime price. You pay once and you're good for life. Grammarly, I still pay an annual subscription. Maybe one day I'll stop. But Pro Writing Aid is just great. It has more features. They have a really good team. They're very responsive when you email them. All those are things that I love. So I changed the software a little bit. I couldn't have afforded the lifetime license of Pro Writing Aid when I was starting out. I had to use the free version of Grammarly. So that's where I was. Then the next iteration is getting someone else to do. And I hired Alice, my full-time editor. Because boy, she's an amazing editor and she can do amazing things. Now she does use Pro Writing Aid as part of her process. When I was deciding if we should switch from Grammarly to Pro Writing Aid inside of our team, guess who was in charge of that decision? It wasn't me. I said, Alice, which one of these is better? And she started using Pro Writing Aid. We had a long discussion about it and she made the decision. Why? Because she does the majority of the editing. So we're always looking for tools. So in this case, think about this. I have a person working for me and then we found a software tool to improve her efficiency. So even when you're working for someone else, sometimes, oftentimes you use software to improve. I do this all the time. Uh, with my video editor, we use this piece of software that I bought for myself that lets you add subtitles. I have a paid license that lets you use my own custom fonts. That's why you see those cool comic book fonts below my videos. And now some of my team uses that. So it can become an amalgamation. It can become where things start to get mixed, but it's usually the process, do it yourself, do it with software. Someone else does it. Then someone else does it with software. That can be the progression. The important thing is that you stop making excuses. It's very easy. And I'm guilty of this. Every single episode, it feels like I tell you guys something I'm guilty of and reveal more about myself, but I'm guilty of using my inability to uncomfortable with social media as an excuse for inaction. Part of it is the 80-20 rule. So you have to look at what's the most efficient way to use your time and resources. At certain times in my business, the smartest thing I could do is go to conferences and meet people and set up deals. That's the best use of my time and investment and to do client work because I needed to build up the treasure chest. That's been part of my process and it probably will be forever. I tend to do a lot of client work whenever my wife is pregnant because I like to put extra treasure into our family medical buffer. So it's totally fine if you have an 80-20 thing, you go, know it right now, I'm redirecting resources towards this because it's more valuable. For me, for a long time, investing in social media wasn't a good use of my time or resources. It wasn't the best way to direct my or my team's energies. Now that other structures are in place and I have really great team members doing everything else, it's become something that we're working on again. Just like we brought the podcast back to life. I wish that the podcast had never dropped to the wayside because I'm passionate about it. I love doing these episodes. If you saw how much I sweat when I record one of these, you realize, wow, he must really like doing it. <laughs> I walk around 2,000 steps for every single one of these recordings. It's a lot of walking, and I live on the equator. We've talked in previous episodes about TOE, the table of equipment, or your order of battle, like the equipment you have or the resources you have or the ideal team you have. And so you can look in the same way. I want you to see that each of these lessons is building on the previous ones. Each of these episodes is intentional. This is a structured teaching that the order isn't random. So as you think about all the different pieces that you need, then you go, well, what's the most important? So I have this conversation all the time with Paris because she's, she really is my check on bad ideas. 90% of what she does is say, that's a terrible idea. And it helps to have that person in your life because I didn't have the person for a long time who I implemented a lot of bad ideas over the last 10 years. So we're constantly discussing um, different things I want someone to handle and we go, we have a discussion. Who can fill in that gap? Who's the right person to fill in that technology gap? Because we have a large team, Sometimes we could deploy a person. Now, there are people on the team now whose time is maxed out. They're actually working and they're busy a full 40 hours a week. Some people are only doing 12 or 15 hours a week because they need more tasks in front of them. Uh, everyone on my team, I want to give them as many hours to work as they need because I know they need to support their families and I want to make that happen. So we look at who's the right person to do this. Do they have the bandwidth? Can they learn it or is it their skill set? A lot of times we have to go through a training process. One of the best people on my team is Alex. Alex runs most of my extreme giving campaigns. When he first started working for us, there were a lot of problems. There were a lot of, a lot of things went wrong with our extreme giving campaigns. And I thought about what to do. And I realized this took, this was a growth moment for me. I realized it wasn't his fault. It was mine. That's a hard pill to swallow. I hired him, but I hadn't trained him properly. At that time, we had a couple of other team members that were really dropping the ball. One of whom quit another one. Actually two of them quit, which was one of the best things that ever happened. And I had a conversation with Paris. I said, you know what? I think Alex can be amazing. 
what we need to do is spend the next three months investing in him. And this is where I learned you, that, that we can't hire a lot of people all at once. Some people like are absolute experts and they need very little training, but some people, majority of my team, what I do is different. This type of business is not like any other type of business. So unless someone has worked for an internet marketer like me before, what I need them to do is something they've never heard of before, something that's a totally different structure. Like someone who's worked for corporate SEO or corporate paid advertising or corporate social media, it's nothing like what I do, right? I've had employees that said, I don't like that your business every week, we look at how much money I generated. It stresses me out. I say, yeah, it stresses me out every week because I got to pay everyone. Every week I look at, did we make more money this week than we spent? I run the business on a week to week basis because I pay salary weekly. If I did it monthly, then I would look at it month to month maybe. We invested a lot of time in training Alex. Any software he wants or needs, I get for him. I've invested in that. He's amazing. I almost never talk to him now. I don't talk about most of our extreme giving campaigns because I don't need to. He went from someone that was really dropping the ball and it wasn't his fault. There were some communication issues. We'd had a manager who wasn't the right fit. So he was sending messages to someone that wasn't getting through to me. So we learned from that mistake and he's now hand down champion on the team. And when we move forward, we're actually looking to start putting people under him to build him a team. We're training him and managing now because he did so well with his first round of training. He's running bigger and bigger campaigns. If you watch any of the digital summits that I organize, the virtual summits where you can watch 10 speakers and they give all this amazing content and there's tons of free gifts and training, all that stuff, he organizes that from A to Z. All I do is the interview. He sends me the questions. So what I want you to see is that if you invest in training your employees, whether it's you or sending them courses, if it's something you're not really good at, or getting them the right resources, tools, or software, then they can become amazing. They can become really great parts of your team. So that's the next iterations. Certain things that were my greatest weakness have become my greatest strength because I've learned, and this was not easy for me, I built and let go of two entire teams because I did it wrong the first two times. So it's been a learning process, but now I know how to fill in the tech gap with a team member because I understand that my job as the boss is to invest in people and train them. And I know that for me, it takes me about three months with each new employee to get it really right. We actually hired two people at the same time about six weeks ago. And I was really nervous about it, but they were both amazing. So usually there's a shining star. I was like, this person is supernova and this other person is really, really good. And we've found, and it's been a little bit of trial and error. So what we'll do is give someone a lot of tasks that don't make sense together to see what's their area of excellence. And I was a little nervous, but one of the people is so good, she needs very little of my attention. She was a, a pre-existing expert. If you're hiring someone who's already an expert, they don't need any training. That's one thing. If you're hiring someone, you're teaching them something or it's something different or something unique to your business model then you're going to need to spend time with them. So we went through that process. And one of them I'm spending a lot of time with because it took us a while to figure out what she's good at. But now we're giving her more and more and more responsibility because she's just, I mean, she's just killing it. I'm really excited about my team members. That's why I like to talk about them because sometimes they hear these episodes. I want them to know how excited I am to have them as part of the Serve No Master team. It took me a long time to get here, a decade. It took me 10 years to get to a team that's pretty good. Before that, I couldn't even get a team that was average. Now I've, my team is amazing, but I couldn't even get cash pretty good for 10 years. So when you're looking at the technology gap, anywhere in your area, I want you to go through this process. And if there's something specific you're stuck at, please leave a comment below so that I know if you're saying, oh, I'm really good at social media, but my area is this. I struggle with blogging or I struggle with website design, whatever it is. Guess what? I'll answer you in the comments and I'll do a special episode to answer your specific question because I want to give you really great content. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Serve No Master. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss another episode. And we'll be back next Tuesday with more tips and tactics on how to escape that rat race. Head over to servenomaster.com forward slash podcasts now for your chance to win a free copy of Jonathan's bestseller, Serve No Master. All you have to do is leave a five-star review of this podcast. See you Tuesday. A fire starts with a single spark. And an army starts with just one fanatic. Start your army with my free guide, how to get your first 100 fans at servedmaster.com front slash 100.